Upper Mustang, the Kingdom of Lo. One of the most remote places on Earth. And one of the last with a pure Tibetan Buddhist culture. A culture virtually unchanged since the 14th century. Mustang sits high in Nepal's Himalayas, surrounded to the north, to the east, and to the west by Chinese-controlled Tibet. This place is not some mystical Shangri-La hidden in the mountains. It's a place where real people struggle to live out their lives, to keep their religious identity. I'm traveling here because the people of Mustang are facing a perfect storm of factors that threatens to overwhelm them. Here we go. A road will soon slice through and open up Mustang to the outside world. And China's presence is growing here. Nepalese security forces at Beijing's request are about to flood Mustang's border with Tibet to stop Tibetans from fleeing Chinese rule. For half a decade, I was a correspondent based in China. I was never allowed in to report on Tibet. But that didn't stop me covering stories about the Tibetan resistance. I've come to Mustang to document another story of resistance, that of a people fighting to preserve something of themselves in the face of colossal change. Kagbeni, the last settlement before entering the restricted zone of Upper Mustang. On the surface, things look the same as they have done for centuries. Tibetan prayer flags cover the rooftops. Dalagiri, the seventh highest peak in the world, continues to cast an imposing shadow over the settlement. But the outside world is beginning to creep in. This is literally where the road ends and the trail to Mustang begins. You know, walking through this town, you can see how modern outside influences are starting to change this ancient culture. Down this street, there's even a Yak Donald's. From here, the journey through Upper Mustang to the capital, Lo Mang Tang, will be entirely on horse. It will be five days of hard riding, covering almost a hundred kilometers, stopping at villages along the way. Tashi Bista has traveled down from Lo Montang. He will be my guide to take me through the mountain passes. All right, Steve, let's have a look at the map, yeah? Sure. So where exactly are we? So this yeah. is Mustang. Yeah, this is Mustang. So as you see in the map, if you see straight east and straight west, north, you have on all these three sides, you have the Chinese controlled Tibet. Some have described it as a thumb-like projection projecting to the ribs of China Tibet. Well, yeah, that is it. And uh, apart from a few places, uh, Mustang is uh, one of those places where the ancient Tibetan culture still thrives and the local people have been and we are still very successful in preserving our culture and tradition at its best. We uh, are consider ourselves Nepalese because we are considered a territory of Nepal now and we hold Nepalese citizenship, so do everyone from Mustang. When it comes to culture, the heart and soul of the people, well, yeah. Well, in that way, yeah, it's true that uh, we consider ourselves Tibetans um, also because um, it has uh, a huge, Tibet has a huge, huge influence in the area. The trail we'll take follows the centuries-old salt route between India and Tibet. Until 1992, the kingdom was, apart from a few exceptions, closed to foreigners.
it's also a hard place to get to. The terrain is so harsh, almost everything has to be carried by foot or on horseback. Along treacherous paths carved by hand into sheer cliffs. This was all once part of Western Tibet. The people here still speak a Tibetan dialect, and they practice Tibetan Buddhism. Mustang and Tibet's history has been intertwined for centuries. After Tibet was occupied by Chinese forces, the Dalai Lama fled to India in 1959. In the 60s and 70s, a handful of Tibetan fighters, known as Kampa warriors, funded by the CIA, launched an armed resistance against China's rule from bases here in Mustang. They set up their camps with the agreement of the King of Mustang. Well, it's really incredible to see that this sort of base is simply made up of a collection of rocks piled on top of each other. At one point, we're told there was upwards of 40 Kampa warriors, all housed in this small little area. You can sort of see why they made these remote outposts. This base is perfectly placed. It's placed halfway up a mountain. You can see this trail very clearly. Uh, you can have a 180 degree view of this trail. You would only need a handful of men to defend this valley. In 1974, under pressure from the Chinese, the Nepalese government sent troops to Mustang to demand the surrender of the Kampa. Fearing a bloody confrontation, the Dalai Lama sent the guerrillas a message to stop fighting. The Kampa laid down their arms, reluctantly. Some were so distraught, they cut their own throats. It was the end of the road for the Kampa. A handful still survive today. We found one of them, Ngawan Sutram, not in Mustang, but in a refugee camp at the foot of the Nepalese Himalayas. <laughs> he told us that life as a gorilla was hard, that while the people of Mustang welcomed them as fellow Tibetans, there was not enough food. Many Kampa were reduced to boiling their shoes to eat. How did you continue to fight, or how did you have the energy and strength to fight when life was so tough? <laughs> Gawan helped secure the Dalai Lama's route out of Tibet over 50 years ago. He's too old now to believe he will ever see the homeland he fled before he dies. Do you believe that someday your sons your children will be able to return to Tibet. No one is joined in the camp every year by Tibetans fleeing across the border with Nepal. The refugees scratch out a living by processing wool for use in Tibetan carpets. Those I spoke to said it was a tough life, but that it was better than living in Tibet under the Chinese. Here, they said, at least they could practice their religion freely. Concerned at the slow strangulation of Tibetan Buddhism within China's borders, the Dalai Lama has called on Mustang to preserve the religion and its traditions. 
But in Upper Mustang's Lo Gekar, the oldest monastery in Tibetan Buddhism, Kunsang Wangchak is fighting that battle almost by himself. His family had been guardians of this monastery for 15 generations. Once, they tended to rooms full of practicing monks. Now, there are fewer every year. Wangchuk's grandfather used to go to Tibet to advance his Buddhist teaching. That's no longer possible. China has put an end to the free flow of travel across the border. So what has been lost then without this two-way sharing? Are you worried about the future of this monastery, about the future of Tibet Buddhism? In the nearby village of Geling, the dwindling number of monks is bringing a more immediate threat. The monastery's monks told me that the fewer they are in number, the more vulnerable they are to thieves. The monks here have long had to deal with theft. In the upper part of the monastery, they showed me a centuries-old severed hand of a thief. The local people here have found it almost impossible to stop art thieves and looters tearing through remote monasteries and stupas, stripping them of valuables. As I found out, Mustang is an easy target for treasure hunters. Well, we can't tell you where we are at this point out of concerns that the priceless items in this room could be stolen. But take a look at this. Chain mail that must be hundreds of years old, ancient masks, bells as well. This definitely was a prayer room at some point in the palace. Look at this. Old, old prayer wheels. And over to the left of me here, a tip of a spear. We've been told that this palace was built sometime around the 15th century. This was in the heart of the palace. They're old paintings. You can tell that no one has been in here for quite a while just by the amount of dust that has collected. Over here as well, just priceless Tibetan prayer items here in this prayer room, a room that's now long been abandoned. While Mustang's treasures are being stolen for profit, its cultural traditions and religion are holding on. Tibetan Buddhism is ingrained in every part of life. I arrived in the walled city of Lomangtang as dozens of monks were performing rituals ahead of the annual Tiji festival. It's one of the most important Buddhist ceremonies of the year. People come from villages across the region to attend. We were greeted by Sering Tashi, the principal of Chode Monastery, the largest in Mustang, who is overseeing the preparations. 
we are praying for all worlds, for that they, they will to uh, preserve, and how to have the preservation for that uh, for the Buddhas and the Buddhisms. <laughs> Sering Tashi granted us rare access to see the monks prepare at the royal palace. How do you feel about being part of this tradition that is centuries old? This is our very great <laughs> festival and this is one of the biggest festival of our Mustang. And it is still alive. Yeah, therefore I am very happy. And also the big responsibility of this festival is depend on us. Yeah. The festival commemorates Padmasambhava, the man who brought Buddhism to Tibet in the 8th century, and his triumph over evil. He was such a big belief for the Buddhism, such a you have that you have interest in the culture, you get the blessing from there. If who don't believe the other religion, who don't take care for the Buddhism, it's like the, like the dance, like the Michael Jackson dance. Yeah. Tiji is a big draw for visitors. I was just one of many outsiders watching the ritual dances. Tourists come from all over the world, paying thousands of dollars for trekking permits. But the people who live here aren't seeing any of that money. Who has the coin money? The money is not coming here on Abul Muslim. Therefore, we are very sad. They're going back for the Kathmandu. If the half person, the money is come to here, we can do it things. We can sort out all of the end problems. And while the financial benefits are still unclear, the opening up of Mustang means that the modern world is coming in. In Chode Monastery, even Mustang's newest reincarnated Lama is finding it hard to concentrate on his Tibetan Buddhist scriptures. The scriptures are a little bit hard. And if I don't know the scriptures, then my teacher will beat me. Harsh treatment. But monks here say Shabdrung Rinpoche's duty, whether he likes it or not, will be to preserve Mustang's Buddhist culture. This monastery's lama came to our house and they said that, please be the reincarnate lama. And when they asked you, what did you think? Then I was going to cry. Why? When I was small, I hate being a lama. Oh, you hate being a lama? Yeah. His teachers believe Shabdrang will grow into his role. For now, though, he's still very much a 10-year-old boy. Hey, what did you do, what did you do um, when you were back home for your free time? I used to play my PSP. Do you like your PSP? Yeah. What's your favorite game on your PSP? Grand Theft Auto. The outside world is coming in in other ways, too. The TG Festival is timed to coincide with the end of the dry season. The rituals narrate the myth of a Buddhist deity named Dorje Jono, who battles his demon father, who is destroying Mustang by halting the rains. Famine sweeps the land. The kingdom's livestock is wiped out. It's a story that's perhaps more relevant today than when it was first performed centuries ago. Mustang is a high altitude desert. The Himalayas create a rain shadow blocking the yearly monsoon clouds. Temperatures here are rising up to five times faster than the world average. The result, the ice packs of the largest mountain range on Earth are thinning, and its glaciers are receding. Samsung used to be a rich village. 
Now its pastures have turned to dust. Its river has been reduced to an oily trickle. Now Samsung is the poorest village in Lo. Mm. Mm. I've covered the effects of climate change before, but I've never seen anything like this. Here, global warming is not an abstract concept. This village that has been here for one and a half thousand years is basically dead. All this area to the left and right of me used to be used for farming, but the water has dried up so much that the soil here is falling apart. It is simply crumbling. Villagers here will have to move. The problem is they can't afford to. In the meantime, they are receiving aid. What is interesting here is that not only is it coming from the Nepalese government, but it's also coming from China. Only one family a day is allowed to irrigate their crops. It's not enough to survive. Erkin Samo and her four children will, along with everyone else in the village, have to leave. I'm... Back at the festival, the monks reenact the story of how Mustang is saved from drought and destruction when Dorje Jano defeats the demon and banishes him from the land. Water returns to the kingdom. Mustang's king and his courtiers fire antique rifles and muskets to signal the victory. Every year as the drought here gets worse, the ritual becomes more important to the people of Lo. But while climate change is coming, there are even more immediate threats to Upper Mustang's ancient culture. A road is coming, and Chinese influence is growing fast. Upper Mustang. If there is one thing that will change this already vulnerable Himalayan kingdom forever, it is the road. From Kathmandu, it is cutting its way through to the capital, Lomontang. The coming of the road has deeply divided the community. Next year, it's expected to connect to a road already built, coming across the Chinese border from the capital of Tibet. Lhasa. Not only will it open the doors to the outside world, it will make Mustang a major trade route from Tibet through Nepal to India. Chinese goods are already flowing in, many of them out of date. May 9, 2010 is the expiry date. When the road comes, that trickle will become a flood. The region has been self-supporting for centuries. Wheat is the staple here. Now huge quantities of cheap Chinese rice is being brought in, both traded and in the form of aid. Even in the monasteries, they eat Chinese rice.
Chinese wheat is coming into the marketplace too, at prices that undercut the locally grown grain. It threatens to destabilize the whole economic structure of Upper Mustang. The arrival of the road from China to Lo Mantang has meant that these men are having to keep a close watch on China's activities in Mustang. 60 strong, the Lo Mantang Youth Club was founded to preserve Upper Mustang's culture and traditions and ensure their voices are heard by Nepal's government. They were angry that the border with Tibet was harder to cross, something they've been able to do until recently. We hear that the Chinese are spending lots of money for the armed border police, and that soon in Mustang, there will be many, many Nepalese border police on the border. What do you think about that? Is that something that you welcome? Uh, lots of Tibetan people, you know, they escaped through Mustang route. Like uh, Karmapa, he also escaped from like Mustang part, you know. From uh, that's where they make really tight border, I think. In return of the support they are giving to the Nepalese government, they want Nepal to tighten security cases along the Chinese border, along the Chinese occupied Tibet's border, so to control and to limit like um, anti-Chinese activities. The youth told me there were spies in Upper Mustang reporting back to China, and while they were barred from crossing themselves. Chinese officials would often come across the border without permission. Whenever high lama come from, from like Kathmandu or from India to Lom Mustang land, you know, in Mustang, like in Lomantang, always China interfere, you know, where they come here. So how does that make you feel? Somebody from a different country is coming here. So them, they come here very often, like twice a month they come here, they, they bring more, they come here with like more than six, seven pojeros and they also ask about the like activities of Tibetan, what they're doing there, like that, no. You mean they go around town yeah, questioning yeah, yeah. people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Without any this permission? Is, this is part of Nepal, you know. Here, uh, Tibetan come, any foreigner come, you know. We are all welcoming, welcoming for everyone, you know. Because this is not part of China. You know. Yeah, we don't know their intentions and like, like, you know, what is the purpose behind them, like, keeping such a track on things going on here? But all we know is that, like, they have been keeping a close eye on everything going in the city or in the Upper Mustang area. The Lomantang Youth Club say they've been fighting on two fronts, not just against Chinese coming in, but also with the Nepalese government for a larger share of the tourist revenues to be reinvested here. Unless that happens, they say they will close off Mustang and block all tourists from coming in. Last year, from our youth society, we, we, decide, we decide that, you know, if, we, if government not give us like 60 percent, we'll block tourists uh, from October, last October. And uh, they promised us to give 60 percent, but still we can't get that money, you know. You guys are Nepalese citizens, correct? Yes? Yes. yes. Yeah, we're all Nepali. Then how come the government is, seems to be ignoring you guys? I think it's because of the remote area. Here's no transport facility. Most of the political leaders, they won't come in this area. This is border side, and there's no road and facility. If you come from the capital to here, it will take more time. That's why they ignore us, I think. In many ways, these men are a dying breed. Every year, more and more young people leave to look for work in Kathmandu or abroad. If they stay, most of them can expect to spend their lives tending livestock and farming. While being closed off has meant the culture has survived, it's also meant that life is hard. Most people here don't live to see their 60th birthday. There are no hospitals in Upper Mustang. When people fall seriously ill, they either pay thousands of dollars for a helicopter out, or they take their chances. It's my point of view, it's not necessary for the road, it's necessary for the one emergency hospital in here, Lamantang and Upper Mustang. Last year, and the one lady, she's asleep, and she impact for the head and she needed for the hospital. She sang for the hospital, hospital. Four days left, she died there. If we can take for the hospital, she has life now. So that's not life. I don't think that's really like the 
like the animals. People are going to die the like animals. We witnessed that lack of health care as we headed from Lo Mong Tong to the border with Tibet. Well, we've just had to stop for a second here and pick up an extremely sick baby. The family tells us the baby is around 13 months old. They've asked us to take them back to the village, and that's what we're doing. They had walked all day in the sun and wind to take the young child, burning up with a fever, to Lo Montang. We took them as far as we could along the road that has been built. The family just went to see a local Tibetan doctor. He said there's nothing he can do for the sick child. There are no hospitals in Mustang. There are no certified physicians. This is a typical case of what happens when people are sick. There's something to take this boy now, home to his village, and hope that he somehow heals. They were now heading home to just hope for the best. As I left them at the entrance to their village, the child's grandmother burst into tears. She was scared her granddaughter would die and was angry at the government. Angry that despite millions of dollars in tourist revenue, people here have no access to health services. We left the family to drive on towards the border. But as we got closer, we were stopped at a Nepalese police check post. A whole new police barracks was being constructed here, completely paid for, we were told, by the Chinese government. We're still several kilometers away from the border, but we've been stopped by Nepal's border police. These officers here, they're telling us that we can't go further unless we're accompanied by two of their security personnel. Over the next year, there's going to be 10,000 of these guys that will be dispatched all along the Himalayan range. They're partially trained and partially funded by the Chinese government. It really underscores how paranoid the Chinese government is in regards to this Tibetan area. They think, he's saying that they think if we go, like too many foreigners go to the border, they think that there are like, uh, you know, spies coming in or whatever, something like that, like foreign intrusion. China, China thinks there'll be spies coming in. Yeah. Joined by our police handlers, we continued on. Just before the border, evidence of Mustang's increasing dealings with China was littered everywhere. Two times every year, around 50 trucks laden with Chinese goods comes over from the border. They set up shop here. Hundreds of thousands of US dollars is traded at this site. Traded may not be the proper word here as it really only goes one way. Mustang people buying from Chinese traders. You can see here bottles of Chinese beer, Chinese liquor. The waste here is somewhat symbolic of the growing dependence Mustang people have on China. In the winter of 1999, it was here that the Karmapa Lama escaped Chinese control Tibet, traveling on horseback in freezing temperatures. Tibet's third most important reincarnated Lama the Karmapa is expected to become the spiritual face of Tibetan Buddhism when the Dalai Lama passes. His escape was possibly the single most humiliating incident for China's Tibet policy in decades. Since then, the Chinese have kept a close watch here. Before the Karmapa was coming from this way, the water is very open. Local people, they can go to there and, and Tibet, and they can come to here. So that not because all our monks they're going to do in pujas there. Then since of the Kamapas come now, the big borders become to very close. Now we can't border. Even his monks very really strict there. Well, we have reached the border between the two countries. We're being told that this is as far as we can go. This headstone marks the Nepal side here, and on that side is the Chinese side. You can see the security fencing stretching for kilometers this way and that way. I was a correspondent covering China for about five years. I was never allowed into Tibet. This is the closest I've ever been. 
Many Tibetans in exile often talk to me about the high level of security that exists. And you can see it here in the form of the security fencing. There's a Chinese army base down the road on the Chinese side. And we understand they watch everything that goes on here. When the road comes, this place will change. While the people of Mustang don't know exactly how, perhaps the answer lies hundreds of kilometers away in another part of Nepal. Kodari is another border crossing between Nepal and Tibet. Like Mustang, it is also an entry point for Tibetans fleeing Chinese control. This is the largest trading passage between the two nations. There is also a heavy security presence here. Chinese secret police watch over everything. Hey, 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 hey. We're, we're on Nepal. We have our major here. We have our major here. We have the major here. We have the major here. Excuse me. Excuse me, sir. Sir, excuse me. Sir, 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 sir. Although we were filming on Nepalese soil with a police escort, the Chinese appeared to be the authority here. This obsession with controlling its borders has led China to pour millions of dollars into Nepal's Armed Police Force, or APF. I've come to see them train in the Kathmandu Valley. Twenty thousand of them are to be deployed to the border areas, including Mustang. China is paying hard cash for this. $20 million of military aid. Although they were happy for us to film their exercises, no one from the APF would answer questions about their funding on camera. Or respond to a number of allegations accusing them of extrajudicial killings, beatings, and torture. First thing you have to realize that Nepal is next door to Tibet. And for China, Tibet is always that very kind of volatile region, you know. China's primary interest is Tibet. And uh, ensuring that, this, that there is a strong central government in Kathmandu that cracks down on Tibetan protesters and does not allow unrest, Tibetan, uh, unrest from t uh, Tibetan refugees to, uh, to destabilize either Tibet or, 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 or the region. Policing the almost one and a half thousand kilometer long border with China will be a massive task. And China's intention to even try speaks volumes about its interests in Nepal. The Himalayas are so huge and big, and how do you police them? I mean, like, it's impossible. The, the, the terrain, the length, the size, it's impossible to police the Himalayas, but the fact that they have been mobilized at all is a huge political statement that Nepal will have to be careful about Chinese sensitivities. This, this shows that the Chinese want to penetrate into the bureaucracy as well and ensure that even if sections of the top, the top leadership, the top political leadership is not being sensitive to its interests, the Chinese can directly ask sections of the police and sections of the home ministry and sections of the bureaucracy to, uh, to cater to their security interests. The APF have also been sent in to bat in charge Tibetan protesters in Kathmandu. It raises questions about Nepalese sovereignty. The Nepalese government has been accused of selling out and doing China's bidding in exchange for aid. Uh, we have very good relations with China. We want to protect it. And the problem of uh, uh, Tibetan is the problem of China. And uh, we, are, we are doing according to the international principle of democracy and human rights here. Not more than that. The Chinese embassy in Kathmandu is the most powerful embassy, even compared to American embassy or, or Indian embassy. And they have only one agenda, how to restrict, restrain, if possible, you know, uh, control uh, uh, Tibetan in Nepal. 
Tibetans living in Nepal are worried about China's growing influence here. In 2008, ahead of the Olympic Games in Beijing, many of Nepal's 20,000-strong Tibetan community took to the streets to show their support for protests taking place in Tibet's capital, Lhasa. Despite Nepalese security making dozens of arrests, the media coverage angered and embarrassed China. Since those demonstrations, China has put pressure on the Nepalese government to crack down on Tibetan exiles. Arbitrary arrests and beatings are commonplace. Now Tibetan activists in Kathmandu have to meet in secret, on rooftops, in people's houses. Punk is a leader in the underground movement. He's been arrested more than 60 times. He's taking a risk just speaking to us. They have beat us. They have even the uh, Nepali police have broken our uh, friends' legs. And these all are like, you know, humiliation, you know. It's, it's all about the Chinese pressure on uh, Nepal government. Any gathering of Tibetans without government approval is now illegal. Refugees caught crossing the border have been deported back to China. There has never been a more dangerous time to be a Tibetan in Nepal. Many Tibetans, when we speak each other, the dislocation is that now Nepal is part of China. You know, it's more like put, put Tibetans like us, it, Nepal is like a part of China, you know, there is a lot of restriction on us, you know, same like, more same like in Tibet. So this is the case. What's happening in Nepal, Punk says, is a direct consequence of China's desire to dominate Asia. Tibet, Tibet is a huge land, you know, it's a <laughs> huge land and it's, it was connected with the South Asian borders. Then that, that is why they captured Tibet not only for natural resource. It's very easy to conquer Asia. We can see the influence, you know, we can see the Chinese influence you know, in Pakistan, of course, Nepal right now. My, uh, my, uh, Burma, Mahima is a great, and Chinese leaders great doesn't stop. Communist leaders great doesn't stop. During our time in Nepal, I repeatedly requested an interview with the Chinese embassy in Kathmandu. They refused to speak to us. They were preparing to bring in a new ambassador, a heavy hitter with a national security background. Back in Mustang, it was time to meet the king. At 78, King Jigmi Paul Barbista has seen his land change beyond recognition. He's watched Tibet fall to China and seen his kingdom cut off from what for centuries was its cultural and spiritual lifeline. Nepal's government abolished this monarchy three years ago. Sir, it's a pleasure to meet you. King Jigmi will be the last of a line of kings that goes back to the 12th century. He's too old now to speak at any length, but there was one question I felt needed to be asked. Your wife is from Tibet. You had the Karmapa come through the border at Kerala Pass. Where do you stand on the freedom of Tibet? Do you believe it should be free of occupation or control. Through his interpreter, he told me, it is the right of every citizen to be free in the land where they were born. It was time for me to leave Upper Mustang. 
not by horse, but by helicopter. The journey this time would take just a few hours, not days. When you first arrive here, you're overwhelmed by the sheer beauty of this place and its people, but spend some time here as we have, and you get a sense that within this peaceful landscape, there are major forces at play, whether it be economic or political. And these forces, unfortunately, may be bringing an end to what is one of the world's most pure and ancient cultures. The hope is that an essence of this culture may somehow be preserved. For me, it's been an incredible privilege to come here, to listen to the stories the people here have told me. In many ways, the story of Upper Mustang and its place in the world is an important one. By strange twists in history, geography, and fate, its people have found themselves as some of the last custodians of an important spiritual identity. But in life, nothing lasts forever. I feel I've had a chance to document a unique place at a unique time, as these people stand on a precipice, staring at a very different future. It will surely be a difficult road ahead.